Good morning, and thank you for joining us today, Navigating a New Diagnosis of Pulmonary Fibrosis with Dr. Matthew Bingley, Toronto General Hospital. Dr. Matthew Bingley is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto and staff physician at the Toronto Lung Transplant Program and at the Toronto General Hospital Intertitial Lung Diseases Clinic, as well as St. Michael's Hospital. He did his MD and residency in Toronto, followed by research fellowships with Dr. Susan Quagan and then with Dr. Dean Shepard at the University of California, San Francisco. His clinical interests include ILD, lung transplantation, and endobronchial ultrasound. His research interests have included lung development, mechanisms of fibrosis, and lung transplantation allograft dysfunction. I also want to mention that Dr. Matthew Binley is also a member of the Canadian Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation CPFF Member Advisory Board. Thank you very much, Dr. Matthew Binley. Uh, thank you very much, Sharon, for uh, inviting me to speak today and uh, uh, during this uh, IPF uh, Awareness Month. Um, the, uh, to start off, uh, I don't really have any relevant disclosures. I don't have financial ties to, uh, personal financial ties to any uh, pharma companies, although our clinic and the transplant program has received funds from different pharmaceutical companies. I wanted to uh, just begin by uh, mentioning two uh, remarkable people who were uh, very intimately involved uh, with the CPFF uh, who are no longer with us. The first is Robert Davidson, who I met uh, a few days after his lung transplant uh, when he was an inpatient here. And I continue to follow him uh, in the subsequent years as his transplant doctor. And uh, Robert was a remarkable person. He, uh, after his transplant, he, he could have decided that he was just going to enjoy himself and uh, you know, have fun. Uh, but he felt very strongly that when he was diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis, there was not enough uh, information or support and somebody needed to help uh, uh, patients with pulmonary fibrosis and advocate for them and educate doctors and patients. And he, uh, he took this upon himself and uh, started the CPFF and uh, did, uh, I think, an extraordinary job and left an extraordinary legacy. And in addition to the public things he did, I, I became aware over the years, seeing different patients, how many uh, had been visited by Robert or had had long phone calls with them or when they were diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis, he you know, drove up to Peterborough and spent the afternoon with them to, uh, to answer their questions and, and give them his comfort and, and support. Uh, the second uh, person I would like to mention is uh, Barbara Barr, uh, Barbara Barr Haylock, who died this February, who I, I followed for her, her pulmonary fibrosis uh, and then for her transplant. And uh, uh, Barbara was a very, very uh, determined uh, woman who um, uh, became very active with the CPFF and on its board. And I will always remember an international conference on airway fibrosis and lung fibrosis held outside Montreal, where Barbara seized the microphone and, and uh, lectured a, a room full of, uh, you know, world experts, um, uh, on reminding them about the patient's perspective on an issue that was under discussion. So there are two very remarkable people who were uh, uh, instrumental in this uh, uh, organization. I see there are a number of uh, webinars and talks on uh, this month, some of which are, I think, more uh, uh, sophisticated and uh, erudite than uh, anything I have to say. Um, but I do see quite a few people with new diagnoses of pulmonary fibrosis, and uh, people always have many questions in this, uh, in this setting, and I thought it would be good to try to uh, address some of them. And the questions uh, center around themes of what, you know, what is this diagnosis and, and what does this mean for me? Uh, what's going to happen in the future? Uh, do I need treatment? Um, do I need a lung transplant? So I thought I would try to uh, address some of those things and uh, uh, hopefully uh, some of you will find it helpful. Um, some of you may know that the gaps in a rock wall or the gaps between uh, bricks and a brick wall are uh, the 
fancy term for them is interstices. And um, the uh, uh, lung interstitium is the, uh, is the alveolar uh, walls, which you can see here on the right in cross section. And you can see that they're reminiscent of the interstices between uh, bricks or stones. So these are three dimensional structures, uh, like a little uh, balloons surrounded by a wall of blood vessels, and that's where the gas exchange occurs. So when we use the term interstitial lung disease, we're talking about anything that uh, scars or infiltrates uh, those, uh, that, that pulmonary interstitium. And this is as opposed to a pure airway disease like say asthma. So at the top, this is a, a section of normal lung. You can see the alveolar walls. Uh, that's a small, uh, small airway. These are blood vessels. Uh, below, you can see the scarred interstitium of a patient with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And out at the edge of the lung, uh, this is uh, what's known as the pleural surface. You can see that there's too much pink and purple. So there's scar tissue that has replaced the uh, normal alveolar structure there. And uh, looking at a higher power view, you can see that a lot of the alveoli have been replaced by this thick scar tissue. Uh, there are some still normal looking alveoli, and that's characteristic of IPF, that there are areas that look normal, um, intermixed with areas that are, are profoundly scarred. But as you can imagine, blood is going to pass through these scarred areas without exchanging gas properly, and the lung is not going to function well. If you look at even higher power, you can see this cluster of cells that's known as a fibroblast focus. Uh, and these are activated uh, cells that lay down uh, scar tissue uh, called collagen. And so the consequence of this, uh, uh, of this fibrosis is uh, that the lungs become small and stiff, gas exchange is impaired, and uh, more muscle work is required to, uh, to fill the lungs with air. Uh, the respiratory rate tends to increase and breaths are shallow because the, the lungs are stiff and it's a lot of work to inflate them. And symptoms will include cough, shortness of breath, and also low oxygen uh, levels are, are noted. So interstitial lung disease is anything that, uh, any process that involves the interstitium and pulmonary fibrosis refers uh, specifically to when there's scar tissue in the interstitium, uh, although that's true in the majority of cases. Interstitial lung disease though is not all the same. On the left, uh, this is the CAT scan of a patient with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And you can see, especially uh, in this close-up view at the bottom that the normal lung structure is replaced by these holes, by these cysts, and this is known as honeycombing. Uh, in the uh, middle is a patient with chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and there's an element of scarring. You can see some of these coarse lines and also the fact that these airways, which are the black appearing tubes, are enlarged, they're pulled open by scar tissue. Um, and so that finding implies that there is scarring. But there's also some background haziness and inflammation uh, uh, suggesting that there may be a re reversible inflammatory component. On the right is a patient with uh, more uh, cellular uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis where under a microscope, those alveolar walls would look abnormal, but they would look abnormal mostly with uh, infiltration of white blood cells, not so much with scar tissue. And here you would be quite optimistic that there could be a substantial recovery with anti-inflammatory treatment. So the main forms of interstitial lung disease, uh, um, this is not an exhaustive list, but there's a group called the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. Idiopathic means they have uh, no known cause. And the, by far the commonest of these is IPF but there are a number of others, and some of them may respond to anti-inflammatory drugs. I've marked those with a red asterisk. We then have exposure-related diseases, and those can be exposures to uh, inorganic dusts like silica or asbestos, exposure to drugs, exposure to radiation, or in the case of hypersensitivity pneumonitis, it's exposure to something organic or biologic, and the uh, common causes would be bird protein and mold. There's then a whole large group of patients with connective tissue disease related interstitial lung disease. So these are patients with things like rheumatoid arthritis where the interstitial lung disease is, is one uh, feature of the, uh, of the disease uh, that also affects the joints and other parts of the body. Now, some people have interstitial lung disease and they may have some antibodies or some subtle features of a connective tissue disease, but they do not meet criteria for say rheumatoid arthritis. 
and uh, exactly what the implications are uh, when patients have this uh, uh, so-called interstitial pneumonia with autoimmune features, that's a, an area that's still uh, being worked out. Some of those patients clearly uh, should receive anti-inflammatory treatment, uh, whereas in others, it's, it's not clear cut. And there's a whole kind of miscellaneous group as well. So as I say, this is not an exhaustive uh, list, but it gives you an idea of the sorts of things we'd be thinking about in someone who presents with interstitial lung disease. It's worth noting that of all these diseases, IPF tends to be aggressive and progressive. Uh, it doesn't tend to improve spontaneously. Uh, the other conditions tend to be more variable, and some of them may uh, progress only very gradually or not progress at all but any of them can lead, or almost any of them can lead to very severe disease, ultimately uh, requiring transplant or, or, or being fatal. So I wanted to, to just give you a little bit of insight into what your doctor's thinking about uh, when they're assessing you for uh, interstitial lung disease. And you know, hopefully your doctor is thinking. And uh, they'd be thinking, uh, firstly, what is the diagnosis? And there, you know, the label is important, uh, but, but the label is only important because of the implications. And so the implications might be, is there an exposure to remove? Uh, and that could be uh, something environmental, uh, something uh, in, the person, in the course of the person's occupation, uh, a medication. Is there something that we think might be driving this that we can take out of the picture? Next, we'd be thinking, is there evidence of a connective tissue disease? So this, is things, this would be things like rheumatoid arthritis or scleroderma. And that's based on symptoms, uh, physical examination, and blood tests. We'd be thinking, does the presentation in CAT scan fit with IPF, or does it seem more like something else? Because if it fits with IPF, we know that's the commonest of these diseases, and it also becomes more common with age. So if somebody is you know, in their 70s and they have a disease that uh, looks uh, like IPF on a CAT scan and they don't have any uh, features that don't fit, we'd be quite happy calling that person IPF. Uh, whereas if you have a, you know, a 40 year old uh, with a CAT scan that doesn't look typical for IPF, you really need to be looking further as to what label to put on it. And we'd be thinking, does the patient need more testing? So often invasive testing is not needed in patients who have uh, uh, a presentation that's totally consistent with IPF, but there are situations where bronchoscopy or a lung biopsy may be important, and that's very much an individualized uh, thing. Um, and I'll, I'll comment a bit further on that later. The next key question is, well, how, is, how advanced is this disease and what do we know about its progression? And so there, the symptoms and pulmonary function tests are very helpful, uh, but it's extremely helpful to have, uh, you know, previous chest x-rays, previous CAT scans, previous pulmonary function tests that give you an idea of what the course has been over time. And in this context, we're thinking, well, is it appropriate to give a trial of anti-inflammatory treatment? Does this person need antifibrotic treatment? And if so, is it the right time to start? Will it be covered? We're also thinking about what message we should convey, because I, I think the, you know, we know that overall the prognosis in uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is poor, but we have patients who live with these conditions for uh, a long time in some cases. And it's very hard to know upfront, unless the presentation has been very aggressive, it's very hard to know, uh, you know at what rate things will progress. And so I, I think the, the, the message has to be uh, honest, that this is a disease that tends to become severe and ultimately be fatal in many people. But in individual cases, we really need to see uh, how things evolve. Patients, of course, want to know, uh, why did I get this? And that's a hard question to answer. We know a lot about the cells and the molecules that are involved. Um, we really uh, have very little insight, for the most part, into what sets the process off uh, and why uh, this person got uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but that person uh, did not, or pe among people with a risk factor, somebody with rheumatoid arthritis, somebody who keeps birds, uh, you know, why did this person get the, uh, get the disease and that person did not? Probably you need two things, and this is a very kind of, you know, uh, crude uh, notion of things but you probably need repeated injury to the lining of the alveoli. Um, and that might be from different things. Uh, there are associations with pulmonary fibrosis like dust exposure, wood dust exposure, cigarette smoking, reflux. 
Uh, there can also be a sort of single major injuries. And for example, we see people with, uh, who had COVID, severe COVID-19 who are left with extensive pulmonary fibrosis whose lungs were thought to be normal before. So you need some kind of repeated or severe in injury to the epithelium, to the lining of the alveoli. And then you need to uh, somehow have a problem with the repair uh, response, because usually if someone gets a pneumonia, the lungs heal up and there's no long-term trace of it. Um, but if the structure of the lungs is damaged, if the uh, basement membrane, which is the layer below the epithelial lining, if that structure is lost, uh, if the cells that need to divide and repair, if those are somehow exhausted or depleted, uh, then the repair process fails and the body defaults to depositing scar tissue. So, you know, that would be a kind of notion about why this happens, but exactly why one individual gets it and another does not, uh, it's, it's very hard to explain. It's also important to recognize that genes and environment do interact. And so we know about genetic predispositions to idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and some of them are clearly relevant in patients, say, with rheumatoid arthritis. So is it the rheumatoid arthritis or is it the, the genetics that uh, cause the fibrosis? And, and uh, you know, it's not really one or the other, it's, it's likely the combination. People uh, wonder if their pulmonary fibrosis is hereditary and whether their uh, children are at risk, whether their children need testing. Um, and this is a, a difficult area. So some pulmonary fibrosis runs in families and something like 10% of patients with pulmonary fibrosis have a first degree relative uh, who is affected uh, sooner or later. And we know the genetic basis uh, or genetic associations in uh, some of these families, and that can be mutations in things called uh, telomeres which are little kind of bundles at the end of the chromosomes. They're often compared to aglets at the end of people's shoelaces. Um, there's also uh, something called uh, MUC5B, which is a uh, gene where there's a genetic variant. And that variant is um, present in uh, something like 30% of people with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And it's been demonstrated in multiple cohorts around the world but it's also uh, present in something like 9% of, uh, of the overall population. And so it clearly seems to be important for pulmonary fibrosis, but it's clearly not sufficient in itself. Um, even in these families where we know multiple families are affected and when they've been extensively studied, the cause is not known. Uh, so for sporadic IPF, uh, meaning a, a case of IPF where there's no family history, the risk uh, that offspring will develop IPF is probably quite low, um, although it's, it's probably enhanced over the general population. Mm -hmm. And uh, doing genetic testing on uh, patients with sporadic IPF is a very problematic area because if you find uh, a mutation, well, is it the cause? Is it really the main cause or is there something else? And uh, if you don't find a mutation then in another family member, um, does that mean that they're not going to get pulmonary fibrosis? Or if you find a mutation and you identify it in other family members who don't seem to have any evidence of pulmonary fibrosis, what does that mean about their future? What, are you really, what can you really tell the person with confidence? There, it's also quite common uh, for patients to have very mild interstitial abnormalities, and the natural history of that is not clear. So if you then screen family members and you find that there are very subtle abnormalities on their CAT scans, well, sure, you can you know, follow them up over time and you know, do annual CAT scans, but are you, you know, creating a lot of worry uh, for something that may never turn into severe disease? So I think in families where there are multiple uh, members affected, there's a uh, you know, a real uh, rationale for doing genetic screening, but the implications are very problematic. Um, for uh, sporadic cases, uh, we really don't think that uh, in our current state of knowledge that uh, screening other uh, family members with genetics is uh, probably uh, a good thing to do at this point. And I think even screening family members, you know, with things like CAT scans is, is also problematic. So clearly, if uh, your children uh, have respiratory symptoms, they need to be checked out in terms of should they be doing CAT scans and pulmonary function tests out of concern that they might develop pulmonary fibrosis in the future. That's not really an approach that I would uh, endorse at this point, but the, the whole area is in evolution.
So you've been diagnosed with IPF and, and what does this mean for the long term? Well, I think there are a few, uh, you know, uh, blunt things that it's, it's worth uh, uh, articulating. Um, firstly, this is a lung disease that will likely worsen over time. In almost all patients, the fibrosis is going to get worse over time. Um, the rate of progression is, you know, it does vary. And we see people with mild disease that kind of grumbles along and changes only gradually. But in the bulk of patients, uh, things are going to progress. And it's often, you know, not over 10 or 20 years, it's over uh, two or four or six years uh, that things will get a lot worse. Um, you, you know, you shouldn't uh, uh, conclude immediately that that's what's going to happen in your case. But I think it's important to, to recognize that that's the reality for the majority of patients. Most patients with IPF ultimately would die from the IPF or need a lung transplant. And the median survival from the time of diagnosis is something like three to five years, although there are plenty of exceptions. If you have a different interstitial lung disease, if you have uh, one of the other idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, if you've got rheumatoid lung disease, if you've got hypersensitivity pneumonitis, uh, the course is much more variable. And there are uh, patients uh, with those conditions that progress to require transplant or, or who die from the disease, but it is much less uh, of an across the board uh, thing. And it's very important then to look at the specifics of the individual and the trajectory. Um, there's a lot of information online. There's a lot of bad information online. So it's very important to go to reliable sources. There's a lot of excellent information on the CPFF website. Uh, there are others, including the uh, um, uh, Lung Association and the American uh, Pulmonary Fibrosis Association. So go to reputable uh, sites and don't assume that everything you read applies to your situation. Talk to your doctor. So what can, what can you do? Well, I think uh, there is a lot that you can do. So one thing is to stay positive, to realize, well, the disease is going to do what the disease is going to do, but you can make the best of the situation and do your best to inform yourself, take control of things and look after yourself. Um, a lot of people are not familiar with pulmonary fibrosis when they are diagnosed, and it's really important to know that you're not alone. Uh, there uh, is a lot of information uh, out there uh, that you can familiarize yourself with. There's the CPFF and the website. There are a lot of uh, support groups, um, a lot of which are uh, now operating virtually. So you can connect with other people that are dealing with some of the same, uh, the same issues, uh, the same concerns, uh, the same practical difficulties that you are. And uh, getting that sort of uh, support and uh, linking in with other people is really key. Um, there are always a lot of questions. Uh, write them down and make sure your doctor takes the time to address them. And, uh, you know, really, I think one of the benefits of these specialized ILD clinics is, is that, uh, you know, our, our expectation is that people are going to have lots of questions and it's our job to answer them. And if you're, you know, if your doctor is not able to, uh, to do that somehow, then, then you know, please um, push them uh, to spend the time. Um, if you smoke, you need to stop now. It's not that it's a major driver of pulmonary fibrosis that's established uh, so far as we know, but you don't want to do additional things that are going to harm your lungs further. Protect yourself from infections. Get vaccinations for influenza, for pneumonia, and for COVID-19. Uh, at the moment, uh, boosters are approved in Ontario for people with certain forms of immune suppression and transplant patients. They're not approved for, across the board for patients with lung disease, but this is a, a you know an area that's uh, evolving, and uh, probably there will be a, a program for people to get boosters uh, uh, over the winter. But uh, stay tuned. Next, get fit. Uh, that can be either with a, pul a formal pulmonary rehab program or on your own, but this is really, really important for maximizing your uh, ability to function uh, as time goes on. Next, appreciate that everyone's disease is different, and you know it often will become apparent uh, over some time uh, how an individual's disease is going to behave. Um, but you know you can't make conclusions up front about what your uh, disease is going to do. Um, the um, uh, and and it should it should uh, become a little bit more apparent with uh, with time. So wait and watch. Uh, be aware that you're going to probably have to deal with some of these issues like supplemental oxygen, lung transplant, and palliative care in the future. So. Uh, 
you know, that's the reality of the situation, but you don't need to necessarily uh, deal with those things until your disease is clearly progressing and your doctor should be uh, keeping you informed about when those things are on the horizon. Finally, uh, you know, a lot of people are going to worsen over time. And if there are things that you want to do, if there are trips that you want to make, if you want to, uh, you know, uh, uh, visit family in South America, if you want to go on a big hike, if you want to uh, do other things that are important, then then go ahead and do it now. You know, it, I mean, hopefully the progression of the disease, disease will be gradual, but it's just hard to predict and uh, uh, do these things while you're while you're feeling well. Um, excuse me, Dr. Bingley. Yeah. There's a question. Uh, someone want to know for post COVID patients who are developing PF, as you had mentioned in your talk, does the CT pattern look the same as HP patterns? You know, most, um, no. So it, it uh, often they have an appearance of an organizing pneumonia, which looks like uh, patches, uh, sort of dense patches. Uh, and then there's uh, often sort of uh, widespread scarring, which is nonspecific in its appearance. The people who, um, you know, have uh, extensive fibrosis and are not able to get off life support from COVID, often the lungs are, are you know, completely opaque. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting under, uh, there's been some analysis uh, looking at um, gene expression, and there's a lot of overlap with uh, with IPF uh, gene expression. So a lot of the same pathways are, are activated, but the, uh, the, um, the appearance on the, the CAT scans is usually kind of widespread scarring that doesn't fit tidily into the other entities we're used to. So Dr. Bingley, um, the next question is, if that's the case, then are, do we think, or do you think that uh, with COVID that there'll be more patients um, maybe going down this uh, pulmonary fibrosis path? Yeah, I think there, you know, when there's a single severe injury, uh, what, and we see this in, you know, people with severe drug reactions or radiation pneumonitis uh, after a radiation treatment for cancer, which can cause lung inflammation and scarring. What we'd often see is that people go through a, this phase with a lot of inflammation and then they, you know, recover and, and plateau at some point where there's a, you know, uh, uh, a degree of scarring that can be mild or can be very extensive. And, uh, you know, hopefully people get to a point where uh, they've got a stable amount of scarring and they're able to function well, and it's not compromising their life lives too badly. Um, we, and, you know, there is, there does tend to be recovery over months uh, in these situations. Um, the, uh, I think we are going to see, uh, uh, you know, a cohort of people with, with uh, chronic uh, lung scarring from, uh, from COVID. And, um, you know, hopefully it's only a small subgroup where that uh, process is progressive or where it, you know, re requires them to, uh, to uh, look at transplant. I think we're more often encountering the situation where people have extensive COVID and the, you know, the virus is long gone, but the lungs are so extensively damaged that they're just not uh, recovering. Thank you. So um, do I need treatment? Well, there are multiple issues to consider uh, here, which I thought I would um, uh, discuss at least briefly. And I know there are some other seminars this month that will look at some of these issues in more uh, detail. So first off, um, rehabilitation. Well, there are formal uh, pulmonary rehabilitation programs, as I mentioned, and they uh, can be extremely helpful. You know, there's a tendency when people have a lung condition for people to stop doing things, to uh, uh, get less active, to get out of shape. Uh, and it's really, really important to push against that and to keep yourself and get yourself in the best shape that you can, get yourself as strong as you can, get yourself into the habit of exercising. And uh, doing that in the context of a rehab program can be helpful because uh, there's a kind of expectation that you're going to show up and do it. There's a structure. And there's also a sort of moral support to the whole thing and that you're dealing with, uh, with uh, uh, you're surrounded by people who are uh, dealing with the same issues and can help to tell you how they cope with things. Um, there's also some comfort in knowing, okay, well, is it safe to push myself when I'm this short of breath? Uh, and uh, in the context of a formal rehab program, you can sort of be reassured by that. They also teach people to, uh, you know, cope with being short of breath, to uh, learn to do things in a way that uh, uh, conserves their energy. Um, there are inpatient programs, there are out 
uh, uh, outpatient programs, and currently a lot of programs are being run on a virtual basis. So there's a range of options. So yeah. you don't have to do rehabilitation in a formal program, but I, I would really uh, encourage it because the benefits can be quite uh, major. Dr. Bingley, someone wanted to know how do you um, access a rehabilitation? Is that something that they do themselves or is that a referral? So the uh, through the uh, Lung Association website, there's a list of uh, rehabilitation uh, programs. Um, the uh, and your doctor will probably know about uh, about local programs. Although if you're uh, you know being seen at a referral center, then your uh, local physician might have a better idea. I should know, and I don't, um, uh, Sharon. Whether there's also a list on the CPFF website? Uh, there is. Yeah. Yeah. I thought there might be. Yeah. Um, so and and so patients are typically referred by their physician, but there are um, there are some programs that will take uh, uh, direct referrals mm -hmm. by the patient, or the patient can contact the program, and then the uh, you know that can lead to a request for the physician to send a referral. Uh, supplemental oxygen. Uh, so the blood uh, carries oxygen in different forms. The bulk of it is carried bound to a, a red molecule called hemoglobin. And you can measure uh, with a finger probe based on light absorption how much oxygen the hemoglobin in your blood is carrying. And uh, I'll just uh, skip ahead here. So these are devices. Uh, I just this came up on the Walmart uh, website when I uh, researched, and it was uh, uh, associated with a lot of um, uh, options to purchase uh, brass knuckles for some reason. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe Sharon knows what the connection is there. But these things are about $50. You put them on the finger and uh, it will tell you what the oxygen level is in your blood. And that's, you know, I think a good thing for people with uh, pulmonary fibrosis to have to get a sense of what, what is happening with their oxygen levels. You have to be a little careful because sometimes the reading isn't reliable or people with, um, with Raynaud's where they get, uh, you know, blanching of their uh, fingers, it might not be uh, reliable. But generally it can give you an idea of whether your oxygen levels are dropping or whether there's a change from what you've done in the past. Um, Traditionally, supplemental oxygen was prescribed based on low resting oxygen levels. But in patients with pulmonary fibrosis, usually the oxygen level for a long time at rest is normal. And it's only when people exert themselves that it drops, probably because blood starts going through these fibrotic areas uh, um, when you need to increase the blood flow and those areas don't work very well. And so what we often see is the saturation may drop sharply with activity, and that's usually the basis for, for prescribing supplemental oxygen. So the point in that setting is to use it during activity. Uh, supplemental oxygen can improve people's uh, shortness of breath. It can improve their ability to function. It can improve their ability to train their muscles and keep their bodies in shape. It's not proven to alter outcomes like survival. So uh, you know whether, whether and when to initiate it is a discussion. Uh, there are different sorts of systems. Um, this is a uh, nasal cannula, uh, nasal prongs, which will accept flow rates up to about six liters per minute, either from a cylinder like this or from a portable concentrator, battery powered portable concentrator like that. Uh, often these systems are pulsed so that they may release uh, uh, a pulse of oxygen when they sense a drop in pressure at the nose, and that helps to uh, conserve the flow. If people's lung function is lower, often they, uh, don't pull, they don't trigger it effectively, and so they may need a continuous flow system. As people get to uh, higher flow, they would likely need a liquid oxygen system. So this is uh, liquefied oxygen in a special kind of thermos uh, that can store uh, a large uh, quantity of oxygen and provide flows up to 15 liters per minute, usually given by a face mask. This is a uh, Lady Gaga in the newspaper when she had uh, altitude sickness and uh, her mask is upside down, but otherwise she's, uh, she's showing you how to do it. Uh, so as people go from milder to more uh, severe disease, they often need a liquid oxygen system. And uh, you know there are lots of people who are exercising on their treadmills or their exercise bike with a face mask and 15 liters per minute of supplemental oxygen. So sometimes we need to go to that length. And if that's what it takes to keep the person exercising, that's what they need to be set up with. 
uh, it's important to use the oxygen as, as directed. And you know, there are quite a few people who they're not really comfortable with it at first. They feel self-conscious with it because they you know, may feel like it makes them look sick uh, or, or, and, and, and uh, that's certainly understandable, but it's not helpful to kind of go out and exercise and then come back and then put the oxygen on uh, you know, for a half an hour afterwards. You know, when you, the time when you need it is when the oxygen level is low. Uh, some people whose saturation is maybe only mildly reduced when they're awake, uh, it may tend to drop further overnight, and so they might be prescribed supplemental oxygen overnight. Uh, that's something we would often look at if people's saturations are sort of on the low side uh, during the daytime, or it might be identified through things like a sleep study if that's done for other reasons. Oxygen is dry and it tends to irritate and dry out the nose and sometimes lead to things like nosebleeds. You can use water soluble gel like Saccharis uh, gel or others. Don't use Vaseline. The petroleum uh, uh, derivative can get into the lungs and actually cause a form of injury. So don't stick Vaseline up your nose. There are also uh, face masks that can be used including ones with cutouts where it's easier to uh, you know, uh, hear your talk and a bit less claustrophobic than having an enclosed mask. And that can give your nose a break. So what about management of symptoms? Well, this is a big, big issue. Uh, uh, just briefly, with shortness of breath, trying to keep yourself in the best shape that you can is important. Learning how to conserve energy. Uh, you know, if you have to go upstairs, then you know, maybe don't do it multiple times in a day. Uh, learn to kind of, uh, if you get out of breath, to kind of pause and take slow, big breaths and slow everything down. Um, supplemental oxygen, maintaining a healthy weight. When people get to more advanced disease, opiates can often be helpful. So this is things like morphine or hydromorphone. This is not being taken to sedate the person. This is being done because opiates help to uh, alleviate the feeling of air hunger. And people can often function better. They can exercise more uh, uh, with these low dose opiates in their systems. Some people find it extremely helpful. Some people don't find it helpful at all. But as people's disease gets more advanced, it's usually something worth trying. Uh, cough is a big problem in pulmonary fibrosis, and uh, for many people, it's quite a debilitating symptom, and they get, uh, you know, bad uh, coughing spells. It's important to try to address other causes. Uh, so if people have allergies and postnasal drip, if they've got reflux, if they're on a blood pressure medicine called an ACE inhibitor, if they've got airway disease like COPD that might be uh, managed with inhalers, we want to do all of those things. There are symptomatic relievers, things like honey and ginger that some people find helpful. There are medications that interfere with uh, some types of nerve conduction like gabapentin or amitriptyline that uh, you know, can, some people find them helpful. A lot of people don't find them particularly helpful, but it's often they're worth trying. The thing that tends to be most effective for a cough is the uh, opiates. So things like dextromethorphan, which is over the counter as a DM, like Dimetab DM or Buckley's DM. Uh, and then there are prescription opiates like hydrocodone or, or morphine, and these uh, would often be uh, quite helpful. Anti-reflux treatment is, uh, is an important uh, consideration, uh, but it's controversial uh, exactly when it's appropriate. So we know that gastroesophageal reflux, stomach contents and stomach acid coming up into the esophagus is very common in IPF. A lot of people have reflux without symptoms or without recognized symptoms. Um, there's a concern about whether reflux might be a factor in uh, promoting the fibrosis. We know if you aspirate enough stomach acid, you can, uh, uh, you can get scarring from that, but how important it is in the general uh, group of pe people with pulmonary fibrosis is not clear. And certainly having small stiff lungs where you have to create a lot of negative pressure in the chest to breathe in is, uh, you know, is a factor in driving reflux. So the relationship may go in both ways. Uh, there have been analyses where treatment of reflux with uh, strong antacid medications uh, has been associated with improved outcomes in IPF. However, other studies have not replicated that, so it's controversial. There are other methods for addressing reflux, including stomach emptying medicines, or what are called fundoplication procedures, where the stomach is wrapped around the uh, lower esophagus to help block uh, reflux. The results from that uh, sort of intervention have not been clear cut. Although there's been some suggestion of a benefit in IPF, that's not at all a sort of standard of practice at this point. 
I think in general, our threshold to treat IPF patients with reflux symptoms uh, is low. So if people have heartburn, belching, bloating, we would generally put them on medication. For patients with none of those symptoms, uh, it's not clear. And I think most of us are not routinely prescribing those medications at this point. So do you, I need a special diet is another question that comes up. And I, I think the answer is no, but it's very important to realize that as people have fibrosis that's progressing, and especially if they're on medications that cause GI symptoms, uh, then uh, loss of appetite and loss of weight are very common. And so trying to eat well, eat a healthy diet, maintain muscle bulk is really important. When people get sicker, they, it's often uncomfortable to have big meals. Uh, people might often feel short of breath quickly. Uh, and so then spacing out meals, uh, eating before you're hungry uh, may be important if weight loss becomes a problem. GI effects of antifibrotic medications are unfortunately a very uh, big problem. Um, the uh, diarrhea can be managed with emodium. Sometimes people need dose uh, adjustments, uh, different strategies, uh, including you know, perhaps avoiding things like dairy, avoiding fatty foods. Uh, there's a nice presentation by Sarah Dales, who's a dietitian who works with us in transplant that's on the CPFF website uh, that uh, you might want to review. So uh, what about antifibrotic treatment? Um, a few things to mention about it. it uh, so uh, antifibrotic drugs are shown to slow disease progression. They don't take away scarring that's already there. They do not halt all progression. They just slow it down. Uh, they've been shown to be beneficial in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And uh, one of the drugs, nintedinib, uh, has evidence for benefit in scleroderma and also for a broad group of uh, what's called progressive fibrosing ILD. So some of those other disorders I was showing you about when they have a, a, a progressive uh, form. The drugs are very expensive and it's very common to get side effects. Uh, I'll speak more about that in a minute. One difficulty that we have is it's very hard in individual patients to know what the drug is actually doing. We know that in groups of patients, they're beneficial. Groups of patients randomized to the drug do better than patients, groups of patients who are not. But in any individual, it's very hard to say what their disease would have done without the drug. It's also not clear when it is appropriate to start and stop medications. There's a, a school of thought that uh, you want to preserve as much lung function as possible for as long as possible, therefore starting early uh, makes sense. Um, and I think that that's, a, you know, that that's a good argument. I think there are people though where the fibrosis really doesn't do much for a long time. And uh, we know these drugs are very expensive and they cause side effects. So, you know, should we be more selectively targeting them to drugs where, to patients where there's significant disease progression? And I think uh, there would be a universal consensus that patients with IPF that's progressing, you know, should be offered uh, these medications, but whether to start early is a little bit controversial. The government will also tend to stop funding uh, antifibrotic medication when uh, patients have uh, significant uh, progression defined by their pulmonary function tests. And that is, uh, is very controversial because you know, we know that pe people are going to progress even on treatment. And so you know, it's not really rational to say that just because the patients had uh, progression, that means the drug's not working and it should be stopped. Although, uh, you know, in some cases that may be true that the drug is having no benefit. So this is a, a controversial area and there's no consensus, but we are, uh, you know, constrained by funding rules. So at the moment, antifibrotic treatment is limited uh, in terms of public funding to idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and scleroderma. That's likely going to change uh, before too long. And uh, pay people who are fortunate enough to have private insurance, they may uh, cover other forms of progressive interstitial lung disease that's not IPF or scleroderma. The two drugs that are on the market, the first one that was, uh, became available was Esbriet, which is approved by Health Canada for IPF. The full regimen was three, three tablets three times a day, nine pills a day, although there are also capsules uh, where the dose would be one capsule three times a day. Uh, this has become generic, uh, which is uh, uh, positive in some ways and that the cost has come down, although it has not come down as much as I would uh, have liked to see. 
um, it, it um, you know it does mean that there is less support uh, funded by the manufacturer for uh, for patients, although there's a, a support uh, program that's being put in place. The side effects can include upset stomach in different ways, things like nausea or loss of appetite, weight loss, sometimes fatigue, uh, and sometimes a rash that tends to be worse out in the sunlight. So people have to be careful about things like hats and sunscreen. The um, the second drug that became available is called Ofev or Nintedinib, which is approved by Health Canada for IPF scleroderma and progressive fibrosing interstitial lung disease. The, it's a one tablet twice a day, so it's fewer pills. Uh, this is under patent, uh, so there's no generic. Uh, the main side effect is diarrhea, which affects the majority of patients. And uh, things like nosebleeds can be an issue in a few uh, patients. There are other side effects, like effects on the liver or blood counts, which I haven't mentioned here. Um, these are just graphs from the trials, uh, the main trial for uh, profetidone on the left, the main trial for nintedinib on the right, and looking at the change in lung function, you can see that the people who were untreated declined more, but the people who got the, the uh, drug uh, still declined. Their lung function got worse uh, over the, uh, one year, but they did not decline as much as the placebo arm. So that's the, that's the impact of the medication. Um, more recently, uh, as I mentioned, OPEV has been studied in progressive fibrosing interstitial lung disease, and this is a similar graph uh, from a study called InBuild, where the people with various forms of pulmonary fibrosis who got the placebo arm uh, deteriorated, losing about uh, 190 mils of lung function of vital capacity over a year, uh, whereas the people in the uh, uh, who got the active drug uh, lost about 80 mils. So a reduction in something like half uh, in the uh, amount of vital capacity lost over the course of one year. And this, uh, some groups seem to probably benefit more than others, but it was applicable to uh, across a range of conditions. So what about clinical trials? Well, there have been a lot of clinical trials for uh, pulmonary fibrosis medications over the years. Uh, these are generally designed as add-ons to existing best practice. So it's not considered ethical to have a, you know, a, a study drug versus placebo when we have, um, you know, drugs that are shown to be beneficial. Uh, participation is always optional and continuing in a trial is, off, is always optional. So this is not something that anybody is forced to do. And it's not something that should, uh, you know, affect uh, people's care or whether they are, you know, uh, going to be followed at a certain clinic, uh, uh, you know, that shouldn't be uh, determined by whether they're involved in a clinical trial or not. Often this will involve some extra clinic visits and some extra testing, and so that's an issue for people who live at a distance. Um, studies should be thought of as a way to increase knowledge uh, and help patients in the future. There's no guarantee that it will benefit the individual participants. So patients may be randomized to, uh, to get a, a placebo. They may be, uh, um, or to you know, best current practice. Uh, they may uh, be randomized uh, to a drug that turns out to be useless or to be, you know, in some cases worse than useless. And uh, so, yes, they can give people access to a, a drug that they might, otherwise, might not otherwise receive, but it's really important to understand that the goal is to increase knowledge, not to in benefit the, the participants directly. But if you're open to the idea, then, you know, this is how uh, how we've learned uh, as much as we have about pulmonary fibrosis, and I, I would, uh, you know, encourage people to consider participating. So what about lung transplantation? Well, uh, this is a whole long conversation, and I think uh, Dr. S uh, Scallon uh, uh, spoke about this a while ago, and I think was going to speak uh, more about it um, uh, maybe later this month. I just have a few comments. I mean, this is the, the bulk of the work I do is in lung transplantation. I uh, think it's a fabulous thing and it can have uh, wonderful results, but it's really important that uh, people not go into it with an overly kind of rosy view of what it involves. They need to recognize that it puts a lot of demands on um, patients and their families. And you really need to think of it as trading a chronic condition for a different chronic condition. It involves uh, a lot of testing and follow-up, then going through a major operation, being on anti-rejection medications for the rest of the one's life, having uh, blood tests, breathing tests, and being vulnerable to a range of complications. Uh, and that can include things like infections, including unusual infections, rejection episodes, kidney problems, cancers, and chronic rejection. So there's 
good and there's bad. And I think that uh, the good outweighs the bad in a lot of uh, situations, but nobody should try to uh, you know, minimize the risks. Um, not everyone is a suitable candidate and some people are too sick or they've got too many other health problems uh, or they're just not able to cope with the post-transplant regimen uh, or they are uh, you know, doing things that would compromise their health uh, and benefit from the procedure like continuing to smoke. Um, and so that's something that we would, um, you know, when we are, people are referred for transplant, we would meet with them and, uh, and uh, go over uh, those things. And sometimes we just need to say upfront that it's just not a possibility. Uh, however, uh, people who were not transplant candidates, you know, 10 and 15 years ago are routinely transplanted now, older people, uh, people with other health problems. And so the, uh, you know, the, the area has been evolving. There are international guidelines that suggest that patients with IPF should be referred for transplant assessment at the time of diagnosis. In our setting, I think that is too early. Uh, there are many patients with IPF who will not need a transplant assessment for years, and we don't uh, you know, need to see all those people uh, you know, years and years ahead of time. Uh, but when patients have progressive disease, if they're maybe uh, starting on uh, supplemental oxygen or getting close to that, uh, that is probably a time when it's good to be talking about transplant uh, and having some initial discussion and perhaps a referral. It will take us often quite a few months to see a person for transplant. It would then take often quite a few months for them to undergo the formal assessment and sort out any issues. And then it might be uh, you know, an average of something like four months, but uh, it can be a year or more before a person actually receives a transplant after the time of going on the waiting list. And so that lead time needs to be factored in. And you do not want to wait until somebody is on high flow oxygen and severely ill before you start working them up for transplant. The median survival after lung transplant is between six and seven years. Uh, the biggest long-term problem is what's called chronic lung allograft dysfunction or chronic rejection. And uh, there's a lot of work going on to try to understand why it happens and what to do about it, but it's been a huge, huge problem. Older patients have worse outcomes on the whole, and if you're over 65, median survival is something more like four years. Uh, people, you know, half of people live longer than that, but half of people uh, don't live that long. And so, you know, a lot of people can look at this, and especially if it means you know, uh, relocation and a lot of disruption for their family feel like this is not the right direction for them. But it definitely depends on people's own preferences and values. If you look at the international statistics, these are, this is a graph of the proportion of lung transplants done for different indications for different diseases. And you can see that the dark blue line uh, are, those are the transplants being done for pulmonary fibrosis. And so they've gone from about 15% of uh, transplants 25 years ago to uh, something more like 40% of transplants now. So there's been huge growth in the uh, proportion of patients receiving transplants for pulmonary fibrosis. And in large part, that reflects the uh, fact that, you know, we do transplants on 70 year olds with, uh, you know, uh, coronary artery disease, and that just wasn't, uh, uh, you know, on offer if you go back uh, 20 years. Um, many patients with pulmonary fibrosis will eventually develop end-stage uh, disease. And I, I think it's really important to, you know, to acknowledge that reality. It's also, though, really important to understand that uh, when a person gets to this stage, that there is help, uh, that the respirologist and uh, often palliative care doctors and nurses uh, can help to manage symptoms, uh, can help to manage cough and shortness of breath, uh, anxiety, uh, depression, all these things that come along uh, with that adjustment to advanced illness. So there, you know, when you get to that point, if you get to that point, uh, there will be there will be help and you won't be alone. Um, but, but if you're not getting the help that you need, then you then you need to be, you know, pushing your your doctor or uh, other people in your circle to, to try to get it. Patients with advanced pulmonary fibrosis who wind up no longer being able to support their oxygen and carbon dioxide gas exchange uh, might give consideration to going on a mechanical ventilator if they wind up in the emergency room in distress. I think this is a, you know, a personal decision and depends on one's values, but I think to many of us who work in this area, that is not a beneficial intervention. 
And the reason is that the person is not going to be able to get off the ventilator unless there is some you know, immediate cause that has made the person a lot worse than the way they were. If it's just progressive disease, the person's not going to be able to get off the ventilator. And it just means spending X amount of time in an intensive care unit before the decision's off, uh, eventually made with the person and their family to turn off the life support. And that's a, a difficult um, thing for patients and their families to go through. And so it's, it's really important if, if people are getting sicker to have some conversation about that with your doctor and your family, uh, make it clear who the, is going to make decisions for you and what your values are so that you, if you're not able to speak for yourself, uh, your, uh, your loved ones can, can do that knowing that they're doing the right thing. So not, you know, not happy things to talk about, but it's really important to, uh, to uh, be prepared for those sorts of situations. So I just thought I would put up this slide again. This is what I showed earlier, uh, that what can you do? Well, there's a lot. Uh, stay positive, inform yourself, uh, get fit, do what you can to deal with uh, things that could make your situation worse, like smoking, uh, infections. Uh, recognize that overall IPF has a bad uh, prognosis, but people are different. And uh, the fact that there's a median survival of three to five years does not mean that, you know, uh, that that's what's going to happen in your case. You just need to see uh, how things uh, how things evolve and do what you can to make the situation better. And I think it, we know that a lot of people get worse. So if you've got good health now, then, then take advantage of it and do the things that are important to you. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm uh, happy to, uh, to answer questions or engage in any uh, uh, discussion that people want to have. So Dr. Binley, I just want to say what a thorough and um, informative session. Um, you've actually answered a bulk of the questions that people had emailed me in advance to you. So thank you very much. Uh, one of the things I do want to remind people is that this afternoon, Elizabeth McLeod is going to do a nutrition and pulmonary fibrosis session, sort of what um, Dr. Binley had um, referred to earlier. And also for the palliative care, we've got people coming from BC, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and Manitoba to talk about how you can access um, palliative care before the end stage so that you can keep active and fit and do all those activities that he had stated uh, previously in his presentation. Um, there is one question that um, I'm not sure if you had mentioned it in your presentation, is that given all the situations that can cause PF, what can one do to prevent from um, you know, having PF, especially with connective tissue disease? How can you make sure that you stay just on that side and not cross over and have a, you know, a compromise of PF and the connective tissue disease? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's not an easy question to answer. I, you know, I, I think that people um, with things uh, like, uh, you know, rheumatoid arthritis is the example I keep uh, giving, um, but those people clearly are uh, at risk and it's a, you know, has a big impact on long-term outcomes in, in that disease. And uh, so doing things like, um, you know, like uh, smoking or even, you know, maybe exposing yourself to inordinate amounts of, uh, uh, you know, of dust or, you know, maybe somebody with rheumatoid arthritis, it's not the best idea to be, uh, you know, uh, doing your home renovations. Um, the, uh, I, I think people do need to be a little bit careful. And I think we also have to be mindful that a lot of drugs used in that uh, condition can uh, harm the lungs and contribute to scarring. So it's important to sort of get baseline breathing tests and, you know, follow up if there's any concern. Um, I think for, for people with, you know, things like a family history of, uh, of pulmonary fibrosis, it's really hard to, to know what, um, you know, what the right advice is. I, you know, I think people need to, to uh, live their lives. And um, I, I don't think that, um, you know, I, I think that you can sort of be careful and, and uh, uh, you know, don't do things that are unnecessary and, and uh, pose a risk. Um, but it's, uh, I, I would, it really would seem unfortunate if people, uh, you know, constrain their whole lives around, you know, uh, out of concern for something that may, uh, that may never happen. Um, 
I think as we, you know, as we understand more about these diseases in the natural history, and as we learn to maybe pick out people who've got minimal abnormalities and to know which ones are going to be a big problem down the road, uh, then maybe a very early intervention will make sense. And maybe, you know, you've got some trivial looking abnormalities on a CAT scan, but there's something that, you know, puts you at risk, then maybe we'll know, well, that's a person who needs to be on treatment uh, early on. Uh, but I don't think that's our, our uh, current state of knowledge. I, I think you might get, you know, uh, different views from uh, from different people on the, you know, the merits of of uh, screening family members and screening people early and that sort of thing. But my uh, my take would probably be uh, more at the passive end of what it's useful to do. Okay, I'm not so, sure that's a helpful answer. But, uh, <laughs> so, Dr. Bingley, someone want to know if they have connective tissue disease, like when in their progression should they be saying to their rheumatologist to say? gosh, maybe I should have my lungs check, or is that something that they just routinely will think about, you know, if they're yeah. looking? So, uh, you know, some diseases are more uh, associated with um, interstitial lung disease and lung fibrosis than others. It would be pretty standard to do a chest x-ray and, you know, in most of the diseases that like scleroderma or uh, rheumatoid arthritis. I think if people are going on medications, uh, you know, uh, methotrexate being a good example that are associated with uh, lung fibrosis, but also uh, um, with the, or I should say lung reactions, uh, but also a lot of the biologics, then, you know, doing a baseline pulmonary function test is not a bad idea. Uh, patients who have any kind of symptom or abnormality, I would have quite a low threshold to do a, a, a CT scan. Um, so I, th I think the, uh, um, you know, baseline screening with CAT scans, say across the board, is maybe not uh, is not necessary in people who don't have symptoms and have uh, clear uh, chest X-rays. But the threshold to establish some kind of a baseline, uh, I think, is pretty low, uh, especially in in uh, you know people where they're on medications that might cause an issue down the road. And it's hard to uh, you know sort out if you're uh, seeing someone and they've got some interstitial changes. Uh, you know, if, if there's no background information at all, it's really hard to know. Uh, you know, how, how concerned to be about it. Whereas if we know that, you know, 10 years ago, somebody had a scan that looked exactly the same, it's extremely helpful. Okay, so Dr. Bain, um, someone I want to ask, you know, given that the environmental changes uh, around the globe, there has been recently, as you know, in the news, um, forest fires, and people are wondering um, if you're breathing that in, uh, because, you know, your, your air is not, although it's not on fire, but you know, they're far enough, but it carries over from the winds and everything. Um, is that a concern? Yeah, it's, it's you know, we know that uh, uh, exposure to dust uh, and other irritants, uh, including cigarette smoke, is associated with pulmonary fibrosis, but it's clearly not sufficient. I mean, you know, all of us are exposed to, uh, to dust, uh, uh, the many people who are exposed to cigarette smoking and woodworking, and and you know the great majority of them don't get pulmonary fibrosis. So it's not. I don't think that we'd be expecting a, you know, a wave of pulmonary fibrosis attributed to um, forest fires. But I think that all the lung injury adds up. And I think if, you know, if somebody has uh, pulmonary fibrosis, then uh, trying to make sure that the air around you is as clean as is practical for you to get, I think is, uh, is a sensible kind of precaution. You know, uh, uh, closing the windows and using air conditioning on, on bad days may be, uh, may be beneficial. Having an air filter in the home, a HEPA filter, if the, uh, you know, if the air quality is bad for some reason, I think there's a lot of logic to that. I don't think that, you know, people with normal lungs need to, uh, you know, be uh, overly worried that, um, that you know, ex short-term exposure to forest fire smoke is going to, say, cause them uh, chronic lung damage. But I, I think it clearly all adds up. Okay. Uh, we also had a firefighter that emailed me with this question, and um, it was kind of interesting. So he said that, you know, um, given that this year is the 20th anniversary of 9-11, he said that in the U.S. they've recognized um, the, the chemical dust and everything that, you know, came down the Twin Towers, uh, they recognized that it caused pulmonary fibrosis in many of the first responders from paramedics to firefighters. And he said, as a firefighter, he has PF. And he's wondering, you know, is it because he was exposed to running into buildings with fires and chemicals? Um, is that something that, you know, as a profession, they should be concerned about or think about? 
Yeah, so uh, there's a lot there to, to talk about. So um, I think, first off, I, I would just um, point out that these are difficult things to study. And, you know, it's one thing in a, you know, uh, uh, a lab uh, mouse uh, to have a single intervention and, you know, and show that it results in scarring. But clearly, uh, people uh, have, uh, you know, a huge range of exposures over many years, and it can be very difficult to, you know, tease out what's relevant. You know, what is, uh, what stands out is when there are people, you know, in certain occupations uh, where there seems to be a high rate of, uh, of uh, lung fibrosis, and this is, you know, how it was recognized with things like asbestos or uh, uh, silica dust, um, you know, that these were uh, repeatedly uh, leading to certain uh, presentations. And then when there's a big uh, uh, single event, and so the World Trade Center is, you know, one of the best uh, examples in recent decades of where, you know, a, a substantial cohort of people had this, uh, you know, very intense uh, uh, exposure at a single point in time. And, you know, yes, there is a uh, there's a, 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 a has been a substantial number of people who develop pulmonary fibrosis after that, and uh, you know, of course, what is it in the dust that uh, that drove that, and was it you know little uh, bits of asbestos, uh, uh, silica, uh, you know, lots of other things, um, uh, you know, bits of insulation and and flame retardants and so forth. Uh, you know, I, I think that becomes quite difficult to tease out. So I think the, uh, you know, could the occupation of a firefighter be relevant to someone's developing pulmonary fibrosis? You know, absolutely. Um, I think the, you know, again, clearly most firefighters don't develop pulmonary fibrosis, so there, there must be other things. I think if it's in the setting of um, something like a workplace safety and insurance board uh, claim, I think it's important to kind of go into the particulars and, you know, how long the person did the work and what protection they had and so forth. I think for firefighters as a group, I think it's, yeah, I think it's, it's um, important to appreciate that uh, inhaling lots of uh, smoke and fumes is not good for your lungs. And it may be hard to pin down, you know, precisely how much is too much or precisely what role it played in any individual, but I think it is, uh, it is relevant. I think that, you know, it just becomes difficult uh, to say, well, this person developed pulmonary fibrosis because of that exposure is, it's very hard to make that, uh, a direct connection, unless it's something that's got a very kind of stereotypical appearance, like a asbestos-induced uh, lung disease, where you know it's very kind of cut and dry. Okay, um, I'm just going to ask the audience if you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the Q and A, and we'll ask Dr. Binney. Uh, this last one that I have from someone, uh, they, they wanted to know, you know, given that there's two fibrotic drugs on the market for treating IPF and PF. Um, they're really struggling, like looking at the side effects and, and everything else, you know, is that a, a, a good route for them to go if they don't have anything right now, but they're frightened that if they don't do it now early enough that, you know, when they wait till they're worse, they not, might not be able to qualify for it because they're, they're worse. So they're wondering like, how, how do they, you know, go through yeah. that and try to figure it out what's best for them? Well, the, um, you know, the, the province uh, will fund um, uh, antifibrotic medication for people with a vital capacity more than 50% uh, of predicted. And so by the time one gets to that point, you're talking about, you know, fairly advanced disease. And I think the, you know, the time to intervene and get the most benefit uh, from the anti-scarring medicine would, uh, would be before that. Uh, I think that, you know, it is uh, uh, maybe more difficult as somebody who's feeling completely well, uh, has normal lung function and don't have the impression, you know, and the impression is that things aren't changing very much. And there, you know, what are the trade-offs in terms of side effects? And I think the, uh, I don't think the doctors all see it the same way. And I don't think the patients all see it the same way. And, uh, you know, there's no sort of uh, consensus. But I think if somebody in that sort of situation is progressing, then they're still probably going to have a a good buffer before, uh, you know, before they get into a situation where they're no longer eligible for treatment. The, um, in terms of which drug, uh, you know, both um, uh, profenadone and nintedineb seem to reduce the decline in uh, vital capacity by about half over the course of a year. There are follow-on studies, uh, you know, that seem to show a sustained benefit, but there are, there are no randomized 
studies uh, that, that kind of go on for five years and 10 years to say, okay, well, there's this much uh, benefit at that later point in time. Uh, so there's certainly a, a degree of extrapolation uh, to say that there's a, you know, an ongoing benefit. Um, so I don't think in terms of effectiveness, there is uh, any, any good reason to choose one drug over the other. Uh, there are situations where the, uh, the funding uh, might be different because of the, some of the issues that I mentioned around uh, Health Canada approvals. Um, and then it boils down to side effects. And I think the, you know, the diarrhea is the big one for Ofev or Nintendib. And uh, you know, some people are more prepared to deal with that than others. Uh, it may depend on you know, what they need to do uh, and uh, where they spend their time. Uh, for other people, um, you know, things like the uh, rash and the light sensitivity that can come along with profenadone might be a, an issue that, that really is a problem in terms of their lifestyle, or the number of pills might be, uh, you know, a big issue for some people and whether they're, you know, whether they're prepared to take uh, uh, the, the, a large number of pills with profenadone. Um, so I, I think those are more the trade-offs than any, anything about effectiveness. And I think the, you know, if a person's worried about whether they're going to tolerate medication. I think if your doctor is encouraging you that it's time to, to try, then, you know, try. And if it, you know, they, if there are side effects, they, you know, there can be uh, some troubleshooting done to try to, uh, you know, adjust diet or adjust pill, pill regimen and try to um, uh, alleviate the symptoms. And if the person just tolerate, doesn't tolerate the drug, then you, you know, you know that. And uh, generally there would be an opportunity to use the other drug if, uh, in that situation. Okay. My last question to you, Dr. Benny, someone wanted to know, you know, if they're considering a lung transplant, uh, is it possible for them to bring their family with them to look at all the pros and cons? Um, as Because, you know, sometimes um, they feel that their family members want them to do it, but they themselves might think, you know, maybe this is not for me. And, you know, they yeah, struggle. Well, another, uh, another question where there's a lot to talk about. When we uh, see people to discuss pulmonary fibrosis, we really want them to be with their family members or bring family members. And sometimes, uh, you know, the, the, that can mean multiple family members uh, because it's, there's a lot that we discuss and it's really good to have a, a second pair of ears uh, to, uh, you know, reinforce what was said or, or clarify if there were uh, misconceptions. As people go forward with the assessment, they also meet with the nurse coordinator, with their social worker, and there, you know, we really want the, the family members or the support person, as we, uh, as the term we use, uh, to, uh, to be part of that discussion. And in fact, it's critical for us that the support person be part of that discussion and that they're, you know, uh, understand what, what's going to be expected and, and, uh, and what the role um, involves. I think in terms of the um, decision making around pulmonary fibrosis, I mean, ultimately, the the person undergoing the transplant is um, is the one who is going to uh, you know bear the consequences of whatever decision is made. Um, although clearly the family uh, does as well. I think for a lot of people it is a family decision. Uh, you know, especially when it involves things like uh, relocation, and those are huge considerations for uh, for many people. Um, the um, I think it's it's if people are. Uh, open to the idea of transplant, having the assessment doesn't mean that they're committing to do the transplant. Uh, you know, the, there are people who go through the assessment and the more they learn about it and think about it, they say, okay, this is not for me um, or not, I, uh, you know, not currently. And that's fine. And, and that's, you know, our expectation is that that's the process is about uh, us getting to know the person and figuring out what their issues are, but also for the person to get to know us and, and learn about transplant and, and help to you know, clarify their own thoughts. I think it's important to um, also to appreciate that people's perspective changes. And there are a lot of people where, you know, when the disease is less severe, transplant sounds incredibly unappealing. Uh, but as they get sicker uh, and uh, you know, see how things are evolving, then you know the downsides of transplant, uh, you know, might take on a different uh, a different appearance, and 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 people may be more open to the idea. Uh, so people's thinking certainly does change, and the fact that someone's you know not interested in a transplant this year doesn't mean that you know we don't want to talk to them next year or or the door is somehow closed. There are situations where people just get too sick, uh, but hopefully that's not the uh, the case. Um, but I, I think there are real issues with uh, you know sometimes families. Um, 
uh, you know, encouraging someone to have a transplant when they're really not motivated. And I think that the people who do well with transplants, there are a lot of factors that one cannot control. But one of the factors that one can control is coming to it with a kind of enthusiastic attitude to, you know, make the best of it, get oneself as strong as possible, do everything right in terms of the follow up and medications. And if people are just not, um, you know, motivated to do that, then going forward with a transplant is probably not uh, uh, not the right idea because there's a, I think a strong chance it's not going to go well. And I think if it, you know, depending on what the outcome is, I think you, I don't think you want to be in a situation where you feel like you were pushed into it or, uh, you know, talked into doing something you weren't comfortable with uh, because at the end of the day, you're the person who's, who's going to live with, uh, with the outcome, uh, hopefully good, but, but possibly bad. Thank you, Dr. Bingley. And that will conclude our session today. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. I know our audience and myself have learned a lot from you. And uh, I think this will be a very helpful educational webinar for all those future patients who've been recently diagnosed that they can learn more about this disease and, uh, and feel comforted by that there's lots of support if they need it. Well, thank you very much, Sharon, and congratulations on all your, uh, your great work in this area. And I think the, uh, you know, the support for, uh, for uh, patients, the advocacy at the you know, uh, government level, uh, uh, lobbying of the firms that make the drugs, uh, encouraging uh, training in ILD and, and building up uh, you know, clinical expertise. I think there are just so many ways in which the CPFF uh, has improved things uh, for, uh, for patients with pulmonary fibrosis. I, I, it's wonderful and I, I congratulate you. Well, thank you very much. As you know, CPFF here is to represent the voices of our patients, and we try everything that we possibly can to, um, you know, make their journey easier, and uh, hopefully one day we'll find a cure. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone.